I'm Corey Johnson in New York and in for Emily Chang, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, Facebook, Twitter, and Google all under the spotlight as the Senate continues to probe Russia's influence in the U.S. election. What changes could be underway for the tech giants? Plus, Google unveiling a second generation of its most popular devices, along with some new gadgets. But can they catch up to Apple? And Sonos gets smarter. The speaker company has rolled out a voice-controlled device. We're going to talk to the CEO about how his new device stacks up to the competition. But first, to our lead members. The Senate Intelligence Committee told reporters that they will not be releasing Russian finance ads turned over to them by Facebook. Virginia Senator Mark Warner, a top-ranking Democrat in the committee, issued a stark warning as well. The Russian active measures efforts did not end on Election Day 2016. They were not only geared at the United States of America. We have seen Russian active measures take place in France. We've seen concerns raised in the Netherlands. We've seen concerns raised in Germany. And we need to be on guard. And Senator Warner also stressed three changes that he wants to see when it comes to social media political ads and stories. Number one, disclose if the ad comes from foreign backers. Know if bots were the cause of trending stories and finding a place for the ads to live so they can be reviewed later. Joining me right now to discuss this, Bloomberg Chief Washington Correspondent Kevin Cirilli. Kevin, uh, so glad to have you on the show. Uh, this is fascinating stuff. Um, yeah. And as fascinating as it is, which is a lot, it's disturbing. It is. And I think, quite frankly, that that press conference, I just got back from the Capitol here at the Bureau, and that press conference really, I think, is sending a signal to Silicon Valley that this is just the beginning. Now, Senator Mark Warner, the top Democrat on the committee, went so far as to call on Facebook to release those ads. And the committee's chairman, Senator Richard Burr, a Republican, said, quote, unquote, I'll read it from my notebook, we're fine with them doing it when asked point blank if he believes they should release the ad. The only reason the committee is not releasing the ads is out of respect of precedent for those who hand over documents and give inter uh, interviews and classify interviews to the committee. But the signal coming out of this committee from this press conference is that get ready Silicon Valley because Google, Facebook and Twitter are all going to be invited. They have been invited and will likely now all testify on November 1st. Facebook just moments after that wrapped up saying publicly that they will be participating in that panel. Kevin, A lot of pressure yeah. on San Francisco. Uh, it's remarkable to me also that uh, how focused these efforts were, how, how, how technologically savvy these Russian hackers or emissaries of Russian hackers were in their ability to, to target, use the very latest in advertising technology and get these things out there to have an effect on the U.S. electorate. 700 percent increase in digital social media ads from 2012 to 2016 and those numbers only expected to increase ahead of the 2020 cycle. Two points that I would make. First and foremost, I remember on the campaign trail, every time an ad was released, whether it's in a newspaper or on television, you had to know who was paying for it. The, the notion that, that these ads can be published on social media sites uh, and no one have, has no who, who was pushing right. for them is, is quite raises a lot of questions when you're, you know, we wouldn't accept these ads on billboards on interstates. The second qu point that I would raise just quickly is that Vladimir Putin's propaganda arm, RT, was essentially bundled into an advertising package for YouTube. And these are the type of questions that not just Democrats are asking, but also Republicans. And quite frankly, big social media companies, I think, are really at a turning point right now. And they have spent decades trying right. to craft a perception of being transparent. Now is the test if they're going to provide it, those details. Finally, a it, it, uh, uh, final question, but it's, it's interesting that you've got uh, uh, Robert Mueller and his probe looking yeah. at connections between the Trump White House and, and Russian uh, groups, including uh, uh, Paul Manafort and, and RT, and, at this, and Michael Flynn and RT, I should say. And at the same time, you've got the Congress trying to understand the technology and what was happening in Northern California and with this, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, these fake ads and fake news and so on. 
Yes, absolutely. And aside from the social media angle and these big social media companies angle, I can tell you that the investigation is very much ongoing. Michael Cohen, the president's personal attorney, will be testifying toward the end of October, October 25th, I believe, or the 26th. Uh, they've had nine months of this investigation. They said, quote unquote, they've hit a wall with the Steele dossier. Of course, that was the controversial document. Um, uh, uh, Christopher Steele, the former British MI6 officer, has not agreed to testify with them some public pressure from both Chairman Burr and Ranking Member Warner trying to urge them to cooperate with the committee. Uh, great stuff, Kevin. Uh, we're lucky Thank to have you, you there. Kevin's really uh, in Washington, D.C. We appreciate your time. Uh, you. Coming later in the hour, we're going to continue to talk about some of the developments of the Russia probe with one of those members of the House Intelligence Committee. Representative Mike Quigley of Illinois will be joining us in just a little bit. Well, the European Union has slapped Amazon with an order to pay $294 million plus interest in back taxes to Luxembourg. This is the latest in the EU pushing back on a sweetheart tax deal that it claims tilt the balance in favor of a few select big businesses. The EU also announcing that it's suing Ireland for failing to recover a single penny of last year's record $15 billion tax fine on Apple. All right, coming up with Bloomberg Exclusive, Citron's Andrew Left talks about Shopify. It sent the shares tumbling today after he called Shopify a get rich quick scheme. We'll talk about that in just a little bit with Andrew Left. This is Bloomberg. The notorious short seller Andrew Left is a new target, Shopify. Shares of the Canadian e-commerce marketing company fell big time Wednesday after uh, his Citron research, it's Andy Left's firm, issued a stinging rebuke to the company called it a quote, get rich quick scheme and he called it dirtier than Herbalife. Never one to mince words. Shopify, however, was one to mince words. They declined to comment on Citron's claims. Citron's founder, Andrew Left, spoke with our own Julie Hyman in an exclusive interview. So the market's valuing Shopify as a provider of e-commerce solutions to small and medium-sized businesses. So right there, it just sounds innocuous. It's fine enough. But let's put it this way. Shopify says they have 500,000 customers, websites. Of the 500,000, we know 2,500 are Shopify Plus, which are big merchants probably really enjoying the Shopify platform to give them credit. And let's just say another 25,000 is Shopify Advanced. What this story is about is who is the other 470,000 Shopify users? And that is what has never been discussed on Wall Street beforehand. And as I show and I prove, these are people who have bought into become a millionaire at home, get rich quick, uh, and promises that completely have violate every FTC rule imaginable. As it's all in the report, uh, the correlation to the parallels to Herbalife. Uh, it's, it's amazing that this has gone on. So what, when you talk about these FTC rules that they're violating, what specifically, because you allege illegality in uh, your report, what exact, what law is the company breaking with its practices allegedly? Oh God, first of all, they're violating the Business Opportunities Act. Uh, because they're selling business opportunities. They're not providing websites to stores. They're telling people you can be an entrepreneur. Second of all, is they're making claims that they can't back up. Not just, you know, amazing. With Herbalife, they had distributors that were making bold claims. With Shopify, on the Shopify website itself, are you ready to be a millionaire? Uh, tw how many millionaires were created today? A sample resignation letter to give to your boss once you make enough money on Shopify to quit. Just amazing that this this would be an $11 billion company. Those are all FTC violations. And lastly, Shopify is able to support this business through what they call their partner program. And these partners are bloggers, influencers, uh, and they're also, they are compensated by Shopify and it's not disclosed anywhere. And that also is a major FTC violation. So it's not just one, uh, it's many. So let's take that last point first, um, because I spoke to an analyst today who likened that practice to a practice of a lot of sort of online retail companies or companies that are trying to sell a product and have various spokespeople who are celebrities who are posting on Instagram and what have you who don't necessarily disclose their financial relationship. How is this different from something like that? 
You have to disclose your, yeah, you have to. The FTC has very clear rules about bloggers, about Instagrammers, uh, so it's very clear. And also, you know, it's funny, if someone, if a celebrity goes on and says, you know, I endorse this uh, line of clothing or shoes, and they don't disclose it on the bottom, even though they should and they're required to, you could say, what's the harm involved? When a blogger writes how they just made $10,000 sitting at home, and it's not true whatsoever, and you don't know that they're being compensated by the company, yeah, there's a big problem. Problem there. So, so, I mean, so for this analyst to say, well, other people are breaking the law, who they can break the law, that means nothing. And he hasn't given an example okay, or so whoever what, the analyst so is. What about, so what about disclosure then? What if the company does disclose these relationships? What if the company removes this language you're talking about on the website? As you yourself say, it has 2,500 core customers that maybe account for the biggest chunk of its revenue because about half of its revenue after all comes from a percentage of what its customers sell so there's real fair enough. Listen, stuff being this is, sold we're not here. we're not for, out of 500,000 customers forget about 2500 Forget about 25,000. Let's say they have 50,000. Let's say they have 100,000. You're looking at a company that's trading at over 20 times sales. I mean, after Snapchat, this is the most expensive stock on that per revenue basis. If I, on the market, if I took this stock and just gave it the same multiple that a sales force, a workday service now, these are top of the line SaaS companies, the best of the best, those three. This stock gets cut in half, Shopify. So we're not talking about a cheap, don't forget, you know, when people complained about Herbalife, I think it was an $8 billion company doing like 500 million in net income or something like that. This is an $11 billion company that loses money trading at over 20 times sales that also is marketing illegally. Okay, the, the, another difference with Herbalife, I would say, is that the, this company is not, I mean, these people are not selling Shopify products, right? They're, they still have to come up with their own business plan, they have to no, sell No, no, as a matter of fact, no. Shopify, actually, and this is in the report, Shopify, you can make money on Shopify by just referring people to Shopify, and that's affiliate marketing. So it's not multi-level marketing, it's affiliate marketing. You can also make money on Shopify by writing blogs about Shopify. So there's, there's many different ways. The only thing that's different than, let's say, in Herbalife is you're not selling their own products. But if Instead, you look at their Shopify revenue will take most you. of their revenue is not coming from you know, in other words, how much are they paying out to these people? Do we? Well, well, this is even better. I mean, which even is even crazier. So, 50% of their revenue is subscription fees, and let's say the other 50% is merchant services. And a real pure SaaS company, like the ones I mentioned, the Workday Service Nows of the world, you're looking at 85% subscription revenue. So, right there, it shouldn't even be in the same league with those people at all and it's still trading at over 20 times sales did you short this going into you coming out with this report and at what point then do you close out the short i mean the stock is down sharply today oh the stock has so much more to go i'm still short the stock and i'll stay short the stock and you know every analyst can come out i don't care if they defend it or what you're going to say the stock is, is it's expensive it's illegal they have heavy competition there's a finite amount of tam to it so there's this has got a lot more way to go on the downside. I love Andrew Leff. That's Andrew Leff, founder of Citron with our own Julie Hyman. Shopify, of course, declined to comment on his claims. Well, coming up, Google's virtual reality ambitions are alive and well. We're talking VR next. This is Bloomberg. As we get closer and closer to the holidays, we see product launches from tech giants like Apple and Amazon. But now, Google's turn. The company unveiled a new Pixel 2 XL smartphone and a new Google Home mini speaker and a Pixel laptop and another crack at its VR headset. Google continuing to push its hardware lineup and virtual reality. Emily Chang sat down with Google's head of VR, Clay Bavor, and asked about what else VR. Two things we announced today. One is the new Daydream View headset. It's an update to a product we announced last year that makes all the things that people loved about it even better. So it's more comfortable, the optics are better, so you can see more in virtual reality, and it's really all about taking you places, letting you experience things like you're there. 
Also on the new Pixel 2 phone, we announced that it's been optimized for augmented reality. And what that means is we've made the optimizations to the camera and the sensors so that when you place digital objects into the world around you using augmented reality, they appear more realistically there. So that's one great example. Why is Google interested in this You know, across all of, of, of the various products? Yeah. Well, if you look at uh, some of our core products, search, maps, tools in education, we see augmented reality really enhancing and extending what we can do in each one of those areas. So we talked about the idea of holding your phone up and having it tell you what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. In something like maps or navigation, I think we've all experienced getting out of the cab or the subway and you look at the blue dot on the flat map and you're trying to figure out which way is which. And you walk three blocks in the wrong direction. That's right. You, <laughs> you, you walked in, oh, not that way. You walked yeah. that to, to figure it out. Well, with augmented reality and more precise mapping, which will come in time, your phone will just be able to overlay footsteps right on the sidewalk, taking you in the right direction. Uh, and then in, in an area that I'm personally really excited about, education, we've seen huge promise in both virtual and augmented reality to help students connect more with whatever they're learning about. So augmented reality, for example, could bring a scale model of the Roman Colosseum or a tornado uh, into the classroom and let a whole class of, of students walk around it as if it's kind of there. Now, the virtual reality wave in many ways hasn't quite hit yet. It hasn't gone mainstream as some people thought it would. Do you think it was overhyped? I think there was a lot of excitement about it. And I think with any new promising technology, people uh, tend to uh, overestimate the impact in, in the short term and perhaps underestimate the impact in the long term. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we're kind of right in the middle of that right now. Do you think the same thing could happen with AR and that it will also be overhyped and take longer to come to real reality than some people think? Uh, first of all, I, I believe unequivocally in the potential for augmented reality. Mm. But yes, in the near term, I think uh, people may look at it, wow, that's new, and assume that everything will play out over the next 12 months. I think the reality is a, a lot of us, developers, users, uh, companies like Google, we're going to be learning about how best to apply it in the near term. Uh, and on the other side of that, building more of the, the applications and um, underlying services like mapping for augmented reality, um, it's only on the other side of that that you'll really see uh, real engagement and strong use. And that was Bloomberg's Emily Chang with an exclusive interview with Google's Clay Bavor. All right, joining us right now from San Francisco, Bloomberg Technologies, Mark Bergen, who attended the Google event earlier, covers Google for us quite well, I would say. I hope your bosses say the same thing, Mark. Um, ah. This is an interesting business for Google to be in because uh, they're competing with giant companies like Apple that are so good at consumer products, and Google, I'll just say, is not good at consumer products, as we can see from the sales. So why do they, why do they persist in doing this? Yeah, it's funny. Someone said it was like you know a two-hour hardware event where they barely talked about hardware. I mean, they did un unleash a, a fair amount of new products, and they certainly talked about the capabilities. But the one theme they kept hitting on was, you know, we we're, we have Google's AI here, and we have the best software and services. Uh, and, and in part, you know, as Clay was mentioning, uh, augmented reality is a really good example. Google has a huge advantage there. They've been working on this tech for a long time. They have uh, very huge, great mapping capabilities, uh, but it's something that Apple's been pushing in, and, and the way Apple's advancing is a world in which the iPhone can maybe use augmented reality software, and, and Google has no touch point with the consumer, uh, and that's a, a big concern. So they have to you know, push ahead to uh, for these reference devices to sort of show the world and consumers that, that Google is leading on the software. So are the, you say as a reference point, are they also showing other manufacturers what you can do with Google software so that their device doesn't have to win for Google to end up, you know, there are more Android phones out there than, than iPhones still because this software is free to the phone companies, or the right. phone I makers, mean, the I should say. Yeah, the Pixels is delicate dance with, with the Android home, phone makers. You know, part of the, the reason I've heard well, why Google, uh, you know, started the Pixel line is because they were frustrated with the Android that it wasn't moving in the direction they wanted it to move. Uh, there are things like camera capabilities for augmented reality, um, the voice assistant. And so it's sort of like you know, this is a reference design where they can show Android, look, this is what we think the best of Google is. Um, clearly, they're much more, they're stronger. They're Huawei, Xiaomi. You have these new Android handset makers coming out of China that don't need to rely on Google as much. And, and so Google, I think, also with, with Amazon, they're clearly seeing a threat to the home uh, with devices that, that hit right at their core of, of search. 
and, and I, I guess what I'm, I'm sort of getting at is, is that the business model here is fundamentally different. We, you, uh, people, you know, the, yeah. the, 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 not to insult USA Today, but I will. The, the USA Todays of the world will say, hey, you know, Google and Apple are slugging it out with Samsung. But the business yeah. model between Google and Apple couldn't be more different, even though the products exist in the same category. Yeah, I mean, we don't know how with their device sales, they don't disclose that. It's a small, very fraction of the, uh, of the market. It's an even smaller fraction of Google's business, right? They're still an advertising, primarily a search advertising company. Um, you know, I think it's, it's, it is, you can defend it as a very start, smart, strategic move, and analysts are very excited about it. If the world is moving towards um, more like echo devices, home voice computing, um, computing with gestures. This is a space where Google needs to be. If they're looking ahead and seeing this, if they're being paranoid, which I know they are, you know, they see a world where their core YouTube, uh, their play services, their maps um, needs to adjust to the new computing services. Great, but Mark Bergen, thank you very much. Great stuff from Mark Bergen, who does cover Google for us at Bloomberg News. You can check out his stuff at Bloomberg.com or on the Bloomberg terminal, which I strongly advise. Coming up, Representative Mike Quigley of Illinois, a member of the House Intelligence Committee. He's going to give us his thoughts about this probe into Russian interference during the 2016 and technolo 16 election and technology's role in that interference. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out. Check me out on the radio. You can listen to the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, in the U.S. at Sirius XM, also in Washington, New York, Boston, and in the Bay Area, everywhere pretty much. This is Bloomberg. Richard Burr, the chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, delivered a stern warning today about the prospects of future Russian election meddling. What I will confirm is that the Russian intelligence service is determined, clever, and I recommend that every campaign and every election official take this very seriously as we move into this November's election and as we move into preparation for the 2018 election. All right, well, he's not alone in looking into this and uh, having good concerns about this. Representative Mike Quigley of Illinois has also been doing a lot of work on this. He's a member of the House Intelligence Committee and joins me right now from Washington. Uh, Congressman, thanks for joining me right now. Uh, let me ask you first, is the, the role of technology in this? I mean, we're here, we're talking to a, a business network and a technology show, and, and I wonder, you know, the role of technology and, and the biggest companies in technology, you know, Google and with its YouTube, uh, uh, Facebook, of course, Twitter, uh, they seem to, the Russians seem to have figured out how to influence uh, uh, the American electorate, maybe even more than some of our own politicians. No, obviously they're very good at it. If anyone, uh, they've been doing this for decades in Europe. If, they imag if anyone imagined they'd stop at our shores, they were being naive. Uh, I just read the Facebook ads and watched some of them as well, the, the, the Twitter ads as well, and it's clear uh, they were using the most divisive issues they possibly could. <laughs> Uh, the real issue will be how did they target and you're absolutely right uh, the, the tech community needs to play a role in addressing this working with the american public well the tech community sure played a role in, in uh, uh, making these tools available what kind of tools are we t i understand you guys aren't releasing the ad but give me or the ads plural give me a sense of what those divisive issues were uh, i think if you looked at the divisive issues that candidate trump used like immigration and race uh, you would have caught mo the majority of these ads. So you're talking about uh, ads that targeted uh, Syrian refugees? Are you talking about uh, things that targeted uh, uh, immigrants coming from Mexico? What are you talking about here? Well, I think uh, I think you can grasp what I'm talking about when you talk generally about the issues of race, uh, the divisive points in our country, uh, the issue of immigration and, and migration, and how the American public was reacting to that. Just uh, remind yourself how candidate Trump used those issues to heat up the American public, and clearly uh, the Russians exploited that at the same time. Has Facebook done everything you want them to do in terms of giving information to your committee? Uh, I think this is just the first page, turning this information over to us. I think they need to make these uh, public. Uh, I think there's a number of stances they need to take immediately to talk about this. One is the acknowledgement that Look, if you take an ad out in the, news, uh, the New York Times or on TV for a candidate, uh, there's some acknowledgement of who paid for that. Uh, we can't have this opaqueness. We have to have full transparency and accountability 
on who's attempting to influence the electorate. Uh, second, uh, where were the preventative measures that at least would have tipped off Facebook and other platforms that these could have been political ads? So there's at least two easy measures in my mind that they can look at, uh, increasing public awareness and understanding who's trying to motivate us. How far along in this investigation are you guys? Do you have a sense that this is where it was limited to, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, or do you think it went no. beyond that? Uh, I, I, I think there's probably ads out there that we haven't even found. It's, it's quite possible that there's uh, the use of social media right now that uh, has not been uncovered. Uh, they simply haven't found it. Look how long it took them to find these ads and make them uh, available to us. So it's clear uh, we were flying blind, and we need their help to make sure that doesn't happen again. Well, I asked you about Facebook. Let me ask you about Google. Has Google done everything you want them to do to provide information to your committee? Look, uh, I, as I said, I think this is just the first step, acknowledging that we have a problem, turning over the information they have. The next steps will be to have a public hearing with the House and the Senate committees to talk about a discussion with the American public. How do we make it more transparent and accountable? Uh, how do we make sure that we know who's buying these ads and that they can't be done anonymously anymore? Well, so I'll, I'll, I'll put the same question in a different way. Uh, you said it's just the first step. That makes it sound like you want Google to take more steps to your committee and that they haven't provided everything you want yet. Is, is that, am, I, am I paraphrasing you right or am I wrong? Uh, I think what they've turned over is w what they've found so far. I don't know what else is out there. I don't know the, the, how far along they are, each platform with their own investigation. What I'm suggesting is as they find out uh, information and find additional ads, they should turn those over. But right now, the most important thing is that we prevent this in the future and we make the public aware of how this is uh, taking place. Uh, some of your Republican colleagues in Congress have made the argument that this did not change any votes. That, uh, that these ads did not influence anyone. Do you believe these ads influenced any voters and changed some votes? Look, people buy ads for a reason. Uh, they are successful in influencing voters. If you're asking me exactly how many, I think that's impossible. But if you take all the circumstances that we've learned about in this investigation so far, uh, coupled with um, Roger Stone saying Podesta's next in the barrel, uh, you take all this information that we know so far, you begin to question just how much influence the Russians had. Clearly, there was some involvement. In my mind, there is evidence that there was coordination. Will we ever know exactly how much it influenced the American public? Probably not. Wait, wait, but we wait, must wait, find out what they did. We must find out what they did and how to prevent it in the future. Coordination. Coordinate. Do you, do you believe that, you, that, or at least are you pursuing an investigation in the direction of expecting there may have been coordination between the Trump campaign and these Russian ads appearing on Facebook and, and, and beyond? Let me just direct you to what we know publicly. Trump Jr. saying and acknowledging, if that's what it is, I love it. And talking about a date that he wants this information and then he knew that it was dirt on Hillary Clinton, that is at the very least an acknowledgement, an interest, a willingness to coordinate or collude. I'm not sure collude is a legal term. So that's just the public information at this point in time. Look, there's a lot of dots we have to connect, and there's a growing, more, uh, growing number of dots. What I'm suggesting to the American public when you ask how long will this investigation take, um, it is, as the Senate said today, growing in scope. Uh, there's, it is so complicated, it's nuanced, it's layered, it's textured. Watergate took over a right. year, and the Democrats were in control of Congress at that time. Right. Benghazi was over two years, and that was extraordinarily politically motivated. So this is a complicated investigation. It's going to take its time. We're trying our best to coordinate with the Senate and, and with uh, Mr. Mueller's investigation. Congressman Mike Quigley, really appreciate your time. Congressman Mike Quigley uh, of the great state of Illinois, thank you very much. Okay. All right, uh, also out of Washington, Elizabeth Warren, the senator out of Massachusetts, uh, railing against Equifax and its top executives as they continue to testify before the Senate Banking Committee this week. The incentives in this industry are completely out of whack. Because of this breach, consumers will spend the rest of their lives worrying about identity theft. Small banks and credit unions will have to pay to issue new credit cards. Businesses will lose money to thieves. But Equifax will be just fine. Heck, it could actually come out ahead. 
Former Equifax CEO Richard Smith is facing his second of four congressional hearings this week on the breach that led to the theft of more than 145 million Americans' personal data. Well, coming up, Sonos launching a voice-controlled speaker, adding the competition from Apple, Google, and Amazon. But is it competition or coopetition? We'll talk to the CEO right here next. This is Bloomberg. Sonos, known for its speakers, its audio devices. God knows I've spent a lot of money on the stuff, and I like it. But uh, they have pushed in a new uh, smart speaker space with a brand new device. Uh, so this move now, competing and working with Google, Amazon, even Apple. Uh, let's bring in Patrick Spence, CEO of Sonos, all the way from Santa Barbara, both of us all the way from California here in yeah. New York. Um, this new device is interesting to me, um, uh, not least of us because I've been using Sonos. <laughs> I, I, I built a house once and put Sonos into all the, all the important rooms in the house, and, and I've watched your company change over time. But when, when Amazon uh, showed off the Echo yes. and Google with the Play, I thought, well, God, these are great features, but the sound quality is crummy in these things. You guys are trying to sort of mix the two. We are. We're trying to bring sound quality, design, and all the services you want together. You know, there's companies out there trying to build hardware to put their services into your home, but we kind of look at it in reverse. We want to help outfit your home with great sounding products that look beautiful and really create a platform to offer all the services that you would ever want. So uh, I read about your device, but it's, it's so interesting when, we, when you and I talked about it earlier, yeah. just, we talked about it on Bloomberg Radio just a little while yeah. ago. Uh, so interesting that this really is, a, is an, an echo device I can say, hey Alexa, play Bloomberg Radio, and my Sonos speaker will be playing instead of the, 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 the fewer speakers, the worst sound quality speakers in my Alexa. Yeah, or you can even ask it to play in the kitchen or play in the living room and take advantage of the fact that you have Sonos all around your house. So we're really taking the power of Amazon's Alexa and adding it to the Sonos system so that you can control the whole thing with your voice, which we think is just going to be awesome on top of everything we have today. Now, will this operate without needing an Alexa in the house? Can you just have the Sonos speaker and have access to the Alexa software? Yeah, there's really two options. You can just buy the Sonos one, which has Alexa built right in, and that'll, you know, you can talk to it directly, or you can actually purchase an Amazon Alexa uh, Echo or Dot or any of the Alexa products to be able to talk to your existing Sonos system if you already have your entire house full of Sonos. Like you. So, you, so you really just be able to look at your, your uh, uh, Amazon Dot yep. in one room, your Echo Dot, and say, hey Alexa, play music in the kitchen. Exactly. Play the Beatles in the kitchen, play uh, Taylor Swift in the living room. I keep saying this because I'm hoping I'm triggering Alexas throughout yeah, the country right. people people have got their Alexas next to their TVs. Uh, but uh, it's intriguing to me too that Alexa, that, that, I'm sorry, that uh, Amazon was willing to license uh, its software uh, in a very different model than you might expect from, oh, say, Apple. Well, you know, I think all these companies, as we think about uh, Apple, Amazon, Google, want to get their services out there to as many homes as possible and on as many products right. as possible. And so, really, we provide an opportunity to bring these great services into millions of homes. And it's a win-win for both the partner and ourselves if we do it right. Well, it might be, because they'll sell, on some level, they'll sell fewer speakers, right? If, if a consumer's out there in the marketplace saying, do I want the Alexa speaker or the Amazon speaker or do I want the Sonos speaker? Yeah, with, with Amazon, Apple, and Google, they're after such bigger things. I mean, we, you know, we want to really build the smart speakers for music lovers, and that's what we've been focused in on. And I think they recognize that. We've worked with them for years on their music services. You know, we're the only system to have support of Apple, Google, Amazon, Spotify's music services. So, you know, we've got uh, some experience at this, too. Uh, how, you know, seven years ago when I built a house, I had to wire the whole house with mm. sound and uh, very involved with, with the Sonos control. In, in, in one area, but the speakers all over the place. And it was complicated and difficult. The technology for these small speakers seems like it's changed a lot in that time frame. Oh, dramatically in that time frame. And the other thing that's happened is we've got Wi-Fi, you know, throughout our homes now, and you've got uh, great ability to really deliver the music. We've worked hard to make sure we can deliver the music every time to any room in the house using Wi-Fi. And that's really important for that quality experience that you don't need to run the whole house with wires. Uh, really quick, how big, you said uh, the market's getting bigger. How, but give me a dollar amount. How big is this market going to be in, let's say, five years? No, I'd say at least... 20, 30 billion? 20, 30 billion. Yeah. Uh, globally? Yeah, globally. Fascinating. Yeah. Uh, well, I wish you a lot of luck. It's, 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 it's an interesting product, and you've got up against some uh, interesting competitors. It's interesting to see them working with you guys on this new Sonos One. Uh, that's uh, Patrick Spence, the CEO of Sonos. Coming up, Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg facing off for an AI future. Next, LinkedIn co founder and Greylock partner Reid Hoffman weighs in on this heavy debate. This is Bloomberg.
So the debate over artificial intelligence really got interesting this last summer as Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg took off opposite sides in this debate. Zuck saying, people who are naysayers and try to drum up these doomsday scenarios, I just, I don't understand it. It's really negative. In some ways, I think it's actually pretty irresponsible. What kind of people are you talking about? People like Elon Musk. Responded by saying that Zuckerberg's understanding of the subject was limited. Well, the Vanity Fair New Establishment Summit in Los Angeles. Our own Emily Chang asked LinkedIn co-founder Reid Hoffman about where he stands on AI. You have thousands of people working in these companies, thousands of people working on this project. So that gives you a very broad scope of potential whistleblowers. Like, they're people, if they see something wrong, they can speak up. I do think the thing is to be intentional about what is the thing that best helps society. And I think that is, for example, design AI to help, like, pay attention to the question of how do we have good human outcomes mm -hmm. and how do we do that? And I think that's actually what's going to happen. Now, the examples that, for example, Elon told Ashley, where things like, well, you you cause it to, well, I don't know if this is one he told Ashley, but you, you, you tell the AI to eliminate spam and it says eliminate all human beings. That's actually kind of fictional. Mm -hmm. Like you can actually, as you're, as you're building the safety measures into these devices, you say, look, as you ask for more resources or as you articulate your goals, have humans in the loop. That's a simple safety measure. I already know that Google's thinking about that. I already know that Microsoft's mm -hmm. thinking about that. I already know that Facebook's thinking about that. So I don't think it's a rely on the good intentions. So is this fear mongering irresponsible, as Mark Zuckerberg said? Um, I think it's dangerous because it causes the discussion not to focus on the real issues. Mm -hmm. So we all talk about, you know, like, you know, robots marching in the streets versus how are algorithms already influencing our lives and what are the things we should do for transparency for the right kinds of social out uh, outcomes. It isn't that we shouldn't think about the science fiction dystopias at all, mm -hmm. but we should think about them in ways of steering towards the utopias. Facebook, Twitter, Google, they're all being called before Congress in the middle of this big Russia investigation. You know, they say they're adding more humans to the problem. Can AI really fix this problem, or is it something that only a human can do? Um, I think both AI can get better because you say, well, this is like, for example, here's a weird ad buy. You know, here, here is something that looks like it's, a, it's external forces trying to do political ads. Mm -hmm. Now let's have some humans look at it. So I think the answer is actually both. I think the answer is to improve the AI, to detect it just like you would detect fraud or, or, other, or malicious cyber attacks or anything else, and then have humans get involved and they go, oh, this is weird. Take yeah. a look at this. So what about when it comes to robots and jobs? I know we always ask about it, but it seems like, you know, the, the ground is shifting beneath us as we speak. You know, are jobs under threat, and how many of them? Well, so I think jobs will get transformed a lot, just as any technological revolution changes them. Like, people had this worry moving from agriculture to the city. They had this worry in manufacturing. I think it's another worry, the same thing. We have to pay attention to people, because in these transitions, they can be very difficult. However, I don't think that means jobs are just going away. I think technology also usually creates a lot of new jobs. So, like, an AI may read your radiology exam a lot better than a radiologist, but a radiologist can still be there to talk to people, can still be there to look at the the weird cases that the AI goes, this is weird, I don't know about this, you know, that kind of thing. And so that's the kind of transformation that I think we should be building the technology for. Apple, Google, Facebook, Amazon, you know, they all are in a race hmm. to get there, to be better. Uh, who wins? Uh, well, I think, I think in technology, I think they're all going to win, and I think they're going to win in different ways. I think you'll get, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, kind of great uh, voice stuff from uh, all three companies. I think you'll have uh, Google doing the, okay, this is the one big pile of data. I think you'll have Microsoft doing the, hey, if you want to be building AI with, with confidential or private data, we'll partner with you. I think it'll all be in different directions. You are also working on an, a very well done podcast called Masters mm -hmm. of Scale, where you talk to viewers about how founders take their companies from zero to one to infinity and and beyond, I'm thinking about a company like Uber and what are the lessons in that about what not to do, not just for founders, but for investors? So I think that um, part of the thing is to make sure that you start asking the social impact questions early. Doesn't mean you orient necessarily your whole company around them, invest massive resources in the beginning, but you say, look, what is our mission and how is our mission best of all for helping people? So for example, like in the Uber case, it's like, well, how do we help drivers as well? Uh, how do we make sure that we're increasing safety early on? And you ask those questions early, which is I think actually in fact, you know, like, uh, you know, and I obviously I'm a board mm -hmm. member but I think Airbnb did well. 
well. So I think Airbnb is a positive example of doing this. Mm -hmm. And I, so I think it's still scale very fast. That's still the way you build a globally impact tra uh, uh, transformation. And by the way, if you don't do that, mm -hmm. then you're not the company that has impact. Mm -hmm. But it's to add in these social questions as you're doing and it. And what is the job of investors along the way to make sure they're, they're checking that behavior? Well, I think the, the, the job of investors is very straightforward is to say, look, you're in this intense cycle of this exponential curve. Let's help bring resources, questions, people to you to bring in these other voices as well. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, my partnership does well. That was Emily Chang with a LinkedIn co-founder, Reid Hoffman. Well, that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. A reminder, we are live streaming right now on Twitter. Check it out at Bloomberg Tech TV. Weekdays at 5 o'clock in New York, 2 o'clock on the West Coast. Of course, you can always check us out on the radio. Check me out on the radio every day. Uh, in Boston, New York, D.C., Bay Area, XM Sirius, uh, Station 119 on Sirius, and our Bloomberg Markets broadcast. Uh, also on at 2 o'clock on the East Coast, 11 o'clock on the West Coast. That's it for now. This is Bloomberg.